Um, so I'm here as a clinician and a researcher, and I want to tell you my journey of how I've actually been able to develop and sustain a self-management platform for chronic pain uh, for young people, and the lessons learned from my perspective. So my disclaimer is I'm not a techie, but we have partnered with UHN, so you met Aki before, who was looking for programmers to build this platform to ensure that it's sustainable. So I've built other apps in my lab before. Uh, I think I'm, yep. Um, oh, I'm just gonna go back. So one of the first apps I built was called Pain Squad, which is freely available for young people with cancer, and so some of you may have heard of that. Um, but what the problem is, is that I got the grant to actually develop the app, but they don't give you money to sustain it. So I was with startup companies who then we had no mobile strategy at SickKids, no mobile developers, and so we're left with an app that we're not able to update and sustain over time. So you can see in my program, as Maggie said, we do online programs, I do a lot of patient engagement, and then a lot of our work is around uh, smartphones, we do some robotic stuff and virtual reality. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong way again. Oh, wrong way, yep, let's get it right. Okay, so one of the issues that I work with is that young people, um, probably about 25% of young people will have some sort of chronic pain, whether it's musculoskeletal pain, headaches, whatever. But most of this pain is invisible. So there's probably people in this room that have chronic pain and you look perfectly normal and people don't understand how it can impact your mood, sleep, school, etc. So most young people don't receive um, care that they need to help them manage their pain. So I'm in a tertiary chronic pain clinic at SickKids. We may probably see seven to 10% of all kids that are suffering from pain. And in Canada, we only have 10 pain clinics for children. So there's a huge um, gap in access to care. So in our lab, we're developing mobile technologies as a way to address this gap in care. So we use a user-centered divine approach, which you guys are all familiar with. Just because we can build apps doesn't mean they're the right solution. So as someone mentioned before, we have to go to the end users. In this case, it's children and adolescents who I work with to make sure that this is really what they want, what are the features that they want in it. We then do usability testing and design it and then do evaluation. So one of the first things we did, there are lots of pain apps out there. So we had to convince grant reviewers why fund the development and evaluation of a pain app. So we've done several scoping reviews and the main findings that we found are that most pain apps did not involve end users. So they actually didn't involve young people in their development. More importantly, they didn't involve clinicians in their development, which is concerning because they're providing pain advice. Um, and they don't have all of the comprehensive self-management evidence that we know needs to be in there. And we only found that 1% of the over 300 apps that we found had any um, sort of evaluation that they actually made a difference in health outcomes for young people. So in partnership with the um, uh, eHealth Innovation, that used to be the Global Center for eHealth, uh, they've just rebranded themselves. Um, we built I Can Cope Platform, which is a platform to help young people self-manage their um, pain. So it's to help them understand their condition, to develop healthy coping strategies, and to network with other kids that have chronic pain. So the key features of this application are daily check-ins, so keeping it really simple. We only ask them six questions a day about their pain, mood, sleep, activities. The key features are helping them set realistic goals about how to manage those symptoms, so pain, exercise, social. There's educations that they can go in and um, um, access in the coping library, or also based on the goals that they set, the app pushes advice to them. And then we have a community where they can connect with other people. It's almost like a Reddit where um, we post a question each week. How do you cope with your pain? What's your favorite coping strategy? And people will post in that community. So again, because we built this core platform, we've been really successful at getting funding from associations like the Arthritis Society. So now we have an app for kids with arthritis. We got funded from CIHR to build it for chronic pain. We just got funded by NIH to modify this for young people with sickle cell. And we just got funded to do this for post-operative pain because we know 20% of kids that have post-operative pain will develop chronic pain. 
And one of the things funding agencies like is they don't want to keep funding the development of apps. So they actually really liked the idea that we already had a platform that was built and it was going to cost way less money to just adapt this for other conditions. One of the things we're struggling with is that typically um, when we apply for research grants, we typically do what's called a randomized controlled trial where we randomize people to get the app or a control condition. This is not an ideal design to evaluate mobile apps because technology changes so quickly and most trial designs, even if you do a pilot with just 60 kids, it could take a year and a half, two years for that pilot to be done and by then your app could be obsolete. So in our lab, we're looking at more innovative trial designs. This is just some of the feedback. We don't, we're in the midst of doing the trial right now, but the participants said that they really liked being able to connect with other people, and this is related to the social community uh, in terms of finding different ways to cope. Another person talked about how they really liked the goal setting feature to make sure that it was realistic and not too unachievable, and that they got a sense of accomplishment by achieving those goals. And then what we're trying to do as well, because I'm a researcher and a clinician and I tend to go to conferences and talk about our application, we've now developed partnerships um, in the United States to modify this app for another pain condition called neurofibromatosis. We're working in people with Australia to modify the app for young people with persistent MSK pain. In Ireland, we're doing the post-op pain and we've done a translation for a Norwegian I Can Cope pain app. And again, reducing the cost of this, but making sure that you can scale up to other people and how we're uh, helping to sustain our program is that we're licensing the app to these individual researchers who then pay the additional fee to make the um, sort of changes that are needed. And it's usually just to the content and uh, not the features and functionality. So um, this is really by partnering with the Center for eHealth, or now the eHealth Innovation, they've really helped me as a researcher to really um, hone down the steps that we're using in our lab to really develop and evaluate apps. So really, step one is really determine your objective. Make sure you ask the end users. Analyze the mobile health landscape. So that's what we did in those scoping reviews. You design and create your application, you evaluate it, you monitor it and, and deploy it. And for us as researchers, I was never thinking of the sustainability when I got into this field and it's so crucial um, to, to be able to do that. So just some of the lessons learned and opportunities. So I truly believe that digital health technologies really can complement healthcare that's delivered in the um, in the, you know, in the hospitals and that it really can bridge these gap disparities from people that a lot of the kids we see at SickKids aren't from the GTA, they're from Northern Ontario, they come to be from BC, whatever, to be able to provide these people with them um, as a first step so everyone gets access to pain care and they don't necessarily have to come to a tertiary pain clinic. Other things we're trying to do as researchers is are trying to actually um, now we're developing remote e-consents that can be done in the app so we can do large-scale community-based um, trials without having to recruit patients from clinics, which is really costly to do. Other lessons, again, challenges is that sustainability. So I think we've created a nice model with UHN. So I partner with UHN now to develop all of my apps. My goal is to actually go get the research money to develop them, and then they're helping me with developing a commercialization plan. And then you can see that we're trying to scale this by just modifying it for different chronic painful health conditions rather than reinventing the wheel. And a lot of researchers, when I go and talk, they say, this is great. I don't want to really start from scratch. If you've got something that's developed, why reinvent the wheel? Again, what we want to also see is we've just um, launched a new electronic medical record at SickKids called Epic. And we need to be able to see how we can integrate these health apps, so all the apps that you guys are talking about, into the electronic health record. And again, I think we do have to have some evidence that these apps um, do are effective and cost effective, especially if we're going to be licensed them, et cetera. But I do think we need more innovative sort of designs for rapidly evaluating these to get them in the hands of patients and families a lot sooner. So again, my main takeaway messages is really to develop those long-term partnerships. As I mentioned, I had partnered with several other small companies and I just wasn't able to sustain those apps after the research money sort of dried up. 
Um, and so that's why I've entered the partnership with UHN. I think we really need to make sure we're doing the user-centered design. You guys already know this, but when I really speak at research meetings, it's really important to make sure that we're really involving young people. So I actually bring young people on as advisors to all my research projects um, so they can really help um, make sure that you're focused on what their needs are. And this is the one big thing that I've learned is that we need, when you have these partnerships, you can develop that respect that you need to really understand what it's like to be a programmer, what they need. They can understand what we're coming, how we're coming at it from a researcher, from a clinician's point of view, and most importantly, from patients and families. And so it takes time to build that common language so we can talk to each other. Um, but those are the messages that I would sort of share from a researcher point of view. So good point. So right now, the app is only available um, in the various studies for the populations that we're doing. So arthritis, chronic pain, sickle cell disease. Um, and um, it really is meant to be a self-management app. So eventually, when it's freely available and we've evaluated it, our goal is actually, what I think people need to do here is actually develop an implementation plan so you can educate healthcare providers that these apps are out there that they actually have evidence that they make a difference so that they will prescribe them to patients. And so that's some of the work that we're doing as well is because they have to know that they're out there. I think a lot of clinicians want to provide advice to patients about what apps to use, but they don't have the information to know if they're reliable and valid and actually do improve health outcomes. Um, and I think your question, second question was about the um, reliability of the advice that's given. Our app was developed with clinicians. So I am a clinician, I'm a pain clinician, and we had physicians, psychologists, physical therapists, all help to develop the content, and it's evidence-based, no, based on the science that we know that improves pain in, in young people. Um, hi, so I just had a question about like the actual content of the app. So you said that you're able to uh, have daily check-ins with them with only six questions. So like, mm -hmm. with those questions, like at what level are they and like, what kind of information can you actually glean from like, just asking them so few things that uh, like, is actually able to provide enough insight to like, the app and like, the platform to be able to like, yep. kind of give them advice and guidance and things like that? Yep, great question. Um, so initially, I had developed and validated an, an electronic pain tool for chronic pain that had 21 items. And when we took it to the young people, so we had designed sessions where we brought young people in that had chronic pain, and they said, there's no way I'm going to fill out 21 questions a day for 56 days, right? So we said, what are the most meaningful questions for you that would help you manage their pain? And they were quite clear how much they hurt what their mood's like, what their energy level's like, what their sleep is, and I'm gonna blank on what the last one is, name is. Oh, pain interference. So they were the ones that told us there's no way you would, and keep it simple, and help me manage not only my pain, but my life. So we really took the lead from them on what to measure. Um, and actually, I think on another presentation, one of the trainees in the, the Center for UE, um, eHealth Innovation has actually developed an app that can help you track user engagement, which they've done on this. So you can see where they go, how many goals they set, you know, how many times. We also have a heat map, so based on their check-ins, it'll show them the trends over the past week so they can see if they had poor sleep, that their pain was worse, et cetera, so to help them understand those patterns and how to avoid those triggers. Do you have to wrap it? They can come talk we'll to me afterwards. One more question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
um, thank you, Dr. Jensen. Uh, so I totally agree that young people are actually living with chronic pain every day. And actually, I'm working with a startup called Shukran. And our goal is to con um, provide uh, use the software to connect different databases. So I'm wondering where the data you collected from the patients are safe, and if the, if their software can actually connect the data to the Epic, would it be would it be helpful and valuable in your eyes? Um, so right now, Akib, correct me if I'm wrong, but the data's at this on a server at UHN, correct? Yeah. yeah. And so right now, we don't have the ability to connect it with Epic, but in the future, that's what we want to do with all the sick kids developed apps, is to be able to integrate them. And actually, when we see patients, we have an act aftercare summary, and we want to be able to actually prescribe the apps and put them right there in that summary to give patients the prescriptions that they should be using the BANT or the I Can Cope or um, the IBD app that we've created at SickKids. So that's the ultimate goal, but just because we've rolled out Epic, we haven't gotten to that yet, but I think hopefully within the next year, it'll hopefully be integrated with the EMR. Thank you so much, John. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>